Welcome to Uriah Heap, the Magician's Podcast. I'll be covering every studio song the band has recorded and every bonus track that I can find. Each week we'll go over a new song from the beginning to where they are currently, and as they keep adding albums, I'll keep adding shows. Let the deep dive party begin. In the magic garden, some were singing, some were dancing. Hello and welcome to another episode of Uriah Heap, the Magician's Podcast. I am your host, Scott Haskin, and we've got a really kind of weird situation here. Possibly the only time this will happen on the show. We've had two versions of songs plenty of times before, but this is a little bit different than what we have even dealt with in this season, which has been the craziest season of the show. And uh, so we've got two versions of the song, Think It Over. Now, I want to point out, I think I said earlier in the season, it might have been the first uh, episode of the season, I can't remember now, and I, I apologize, I don't remember if I've corrected this or not. I've recorded slightly out of order because I was waiting for the booklet uh, in in the deluxe CD to arrive since I had to reorder it. And um, unfortunately, the book did not discuss the cover art at all. So uh, don't really have any answers there. I could Google it. But the fact of the matter is I could write a 10 page blog about something that's completely untrue and post it and it'll come up in a Google search. So without an official um, explanation as to, you know, any any information behind the cover. I will uh, just leave it at it is what it is. It is a uh, a replication of the Iwo Jima monument that is in Arlington National Cemetery in Washington, D.C. Why? I don't know. But it is. So um, that that leads us back to the song. So what we're dealing with here is we've been dealing with the, you know, the official Conquest released song with John Sloman on vocals. And several of them have had. Uh, earlier versions that were demos that were recorded with John Lawton on vocals and Lee Kerslake on drums. So that's not what we have today, though. So it it gets weird. We have an a, a single only released version of the song Think It Over with John Sloman on vocals, but Greg Deckert on keys. So I'm assuming this was recorded after Ken left. Um I, I don't have any timeline for it, but I'm I'm going to have to guess that that's what happened. Uh, and then the other version we have is actually from the Abominog album with uh, David Golby on vocals. So, uh, you know, an, another change again uh, where it, uh, we're, we're shuffling things a little bit. So this seems to be like a transit transition song. Transitional, is that the right word? Transitory, transitory song. We'll go with that because uh, I are good at English. And, uh, but they're interesting versions. They're very different. And, uh, and I think it's going to be cool. So we'll get to that in just a couple of moments. And first, you know, it's Monday guys. And Monday is our gratitude episode of the week. And I want to start with my patrons. Actually, you know what, before I get to the patrons, I want to start with my friends at BMG who are releasing a box set, seven picture discs, seven t-shirts, a board, a, a calendar, like a wall calendar, and some lyrical phrases that you can use and you can schedule out your Uriah Heap listening as well as your podcast listening. And it's going to be really cool. Coming out late September from BMG Music, the Everyday Rocks box set. Going to be fantastic. I'm really, really excited to get a hold of my copy of that. Uh, but I want to thank my patrons too, because they're the people that help me keep the show going. They help me mitigate my costs. Um, you know, because of course you guys get the show for free, but that doesn't mean it doesn't cost me money to make it because it does. So, uh, I want to thank my friends here, my patrons at the $5 easy living tier. We have Kenny Wymore and Brad D. Then at the $3, the wizard tier, we have Peter Voss, Goran Erickson, Frank Tealgard Mortensen, and William Rose. And then at the $1 tier, the traveler in time tier, <laughs> the prison cell for everything that is breathable airtight gravesite. Thank you guys all very, very much. It means a lot to me. And, uh, you know, every week when I see my list of patrons, I'm just like, that is so cool. You know, that I've created something that people actually want to give money to. That's pretty, pretty awesome. So I'm glad you guys are enjoying the show. 
And of course, I want to thank Podbean, who is the host, the physical host that distributes the show out to all of the outlets, whether it be Stitcher Radio, uh, iTunes, Apple Music, Google Podcasts, uh, Amazon Podcasts, all those places where the show can be found. Also gives me that wonderful player that I have on my website that you can see on the main Uriah Heat podcast page, as well as the individual episode page has its own player. So there's a dedicated player for each individual song, as well as the one player that hosts, I think it's like the last 20 or 40 episodes. I can't remember. Um, But very cool stuff. They do a lot for me. And of course, my graphic artist extraordinaire, Scott Lazinski, who did the logos for the show and uh, my friends at Audionamics, who made the instant dialogue cleaner, as far as I'm concerned, the most valuable product in the world, saves me hours. I was actually thinking about that the other day, uh, thinking about when I launched my other podcast, the Haskin Cast podcast, and how I would sit there with hours just finding frequencies. And, and, you know, it was ridiculous how much effort it took to put a show out. And now I just have this dial and I, I know pretty much where to set it because my setup is exactly the same every time. So I know where to set it. But basically, all I do is just turn the dial and listen and go, yep. And then I export it with that, uh, you know, with that instant dialogue cleaner on it. So all the airplanes, the computer fan, the, uh, you know, any any other noises that are in the area. I live by an airport, but you don't ever hear a plane on the show. Uh, If you ever do, let me know. Let me know what episode and what time in the episode you can hear it. Because as far as I know, instant dialogue cleaner has removed every single airplane which is pretty good when you live next to one of the world's busiest airports. Uh, So very cool stuff. Thank you, guys. We'll not do a show without you. And of course, my good friend, Dave White, the director of social media for Uriah Heap. He's the one that posts the show on Twitter, to the Facebook group and uh, and all that good stuff. I think the only one he doesn't do is Instagram, but he does a hell of a job with the stuff he does. He's up early. Uh, He's East Coast, so he gets up right around the time I go to bed. He listens to the episode. He posts it for all of you guys. Uh, and then I post in the Uriah Heap uh, fan group on Facebook, as well as, you know, my own like Twitter and Instagram and all that sort of thing. Um, or the Uriah Heap one, I should say, because I have a dedicated Uriah Heap Instagram, Twitter and Facebook page. Um, so, yeah, very cool. Dave does a great job with all that. And I'd like to thank everyone who continues to share the show. I mean, it's cool if you like the post and all, and that kind of helps it get some attention. But sharing it is what really makes the difference. So for you guys who have liked it, thank you. For you guys that are sharing it and help getting it, uh, you know, getting more people to know that the show exists and maybe give it a chance listening to it. uh, Thank you very, very much. So uh, it all helps, but there's certain things that help more than other things help. Uh, And of course, giving me money is the most helpful thing because it pays for the rest of the show costs. Um, so also I want to thank my buddy, Brandon and Metallica, who runs a fantastic podcast on Metallica and my friend Ace, who has the, uh, Ace on music podcast, both on YouTube and Stitcher, uh, so knowledgeable about the business, got some really great stuff and some really interesting episodes too. Like what is a, a famous band's most underrated album was a recent episode. That was really interesting. Um, you know, I, I love certain music. There's a lot of bands that I've heard of that I don't really know anything about and actually learn a lot listening to these podcasts, listening to Ace's show, uh, some really cool stuff out there. And also speaking of cool stuff, go check out gottahearemall.com, G-O-T-T-A-H-E-A-R-E-M-A-L-L.com. I had to think for a second and I don't like to do that. Um, Allegra over there has done some wonderful things on that page with, uh, you know, history of uh, Emerson, Lake and Palmer and Deep Purple, as well as cool, uh, amazing other tidbits. So go check out her page as well. And last but not least, my brothers at the Deep Dive Podcast Network over at AZ or uh, Maiden AZ Pod. We have Eric and Jonathan at Hawk Binge. We have Andy and Matt. And you know what? Speaking of Hawk Binge. Uh, One thing that I did read in this book from Conquest, because instead of being listed as producer, Jerry Braun was listed as, uh, I think it was executive producer, and uh, that was kind of a switch. And the reason for that, according to the book, is because Jerry has gained himself a whole following now, and he's working with a bunch of other bands, and one of them was Hawkwind. So uh, that was the reason that he was executive on this one instead of producer, because He couldn't be as physically attentive as he normally was because he had just spread himself a little bit too thin at the time. But that's cool that he was producing a band that we have a podcast deep dive brother crossover with. Very cool. So um, Andy and Matt, you might find that interesting. You also might not. 
Of course, we have Paul, Joe, and David over at In the Lap of the Pods. We have Rye at Sabbath Bloody Podcast. We have Terry T-Bone Mathley at T-Bone's Prime Cuts on the other side. We have The Simple Man at Skittered Reconsidered. And The Simple Man and Rye have teamed up and they have another show called North by South Podcast, I believe it is. Uh, really cool music, uh, you know, approaches that they have to, um, to, to kind of getting your interest in different songs and things. So go check that out. And then, of course, my brothers at the Deep Purple podcast, Nathan and John. Those are the, they were my gateway drug into this uh, consortium and uh, had a lot of fun listening to all of these shows. I don't get as much time right now as I would like to. So I'm kind of falling behind by a landslide, but I hope to get all caught up at one day, one day because they are all uh, just great shows that I really enjoy. And I'm really honored to be part of that network. So uh, now that we've gotten all the housekeeping things out of the way, let's get to this little song called Think It Over. Now, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this one chronologically. So obviously, John Sloman recorded his version first. I shouldn't say his version. It was that version of the band's version of the song first. So I think we'll start with that one. So here is Think It Over. So we've got a lot going on here. First of all, that's a really cool piano intro. It's very intricate. It's a very interesting progression. Certainly not something that would just be, you know, on a simple uh, pop or rock song. It's very interesting. And uh, and I really like that. And then just going into some real power after that. The guitars sound fantastic. Love what the drums are doing there. That little lead in fill before the crash. Uh, and then, of course, you know, a very um, a very unique sound coming from uh, John Sloman here. As uh, as we've heard on several songs from him, he's really got a good variety of tools as a vocalist. And uh, and I think that's pretty cool. I love the guitar sounds on this. It's very strong. We've seen in several songs on this album, he sort of gearing back to being a guitar-oriented band as they have kind of on and off the, as, as they've switched off with keyboards. But it really feels like they're they're turning their sound into something that's more, um, you know, heavy guitar oriented with keyboards is, you know, a, a slightly more backing instrument than we've seen featured. But, you know, we've got a long way to go. So that could easily change um, several times even on the next album. So uh, there's a lot to look forward to. But yeah, I think this, this sounds great. It really is uh, somewhat off-putting to me only because... I know the Abominog version so well, and it's slightly different sounding from this. So um, it's it's kind of interesting and fascinating for me to hear it in this light, but I really like it. Wow, the backing vocals sound so different from everything we've heard before, but why? Well, we've changed out some players, right? On this album, we don't have Lee Kerslake, who was one of the uh, you know very pivotal singers in the backing vocals. We also don't have Ken Hensley on this song, so it's going to have a, a different sound. And uh, I don't know if Greg Deckert uh, sang on this or not. But it's a very different sound from what we've heard before. I also think that the vocals, you, you know, I like what John's doing on this, but I think that I think his voice could have benefited from some more low end to make it a little more powerful. I think he's singing really passionately here, and I think it sounds good, but it doesn't really give me that edge that I'm looking for. I think a little bit more bass in his vocal probably could have have helped with that at least if if not really 
done the trick for me. But again, you know, that's just me, my opinion. Uh, interesting though, that, um, just, just how different that, that choral section sounds. You know, I think I realized what part of it is. I think John Sloman is singing twice. So I think he's singing with the group. And then I think he's singing slightly over the group. But he's using that, uh, you know, that voice that he's using on the song. And like the same kind of song, voice that he used on Fools. And I think that's part of what's throwing it off. I mean, obviously, there's no high harmony on this. But um, yeah, I think that's what it is I'm hearing. What I do love is the guitar sound. I think it's fantastic. I think this is pretty well mixed too. Um, vocals might be just a, a skosh too low, but uh, overall, I think it sounds really good. I love the powerful sound of the guitars. Um, bass is moving along nicely, but yeah, overall, I think it sounds pretty good. What? That was weird. It, it was just like they they took a mix solo and just muted the channel at the end of it there. Um, I would have kind of expected that that last note would have kind of blended into, you know, the next part until it faded out or he stopped it, but it just just cut off. So that was a little weird. The solo was good. Um, there's really kind of some difficulty hearing some of the notes because it's very affected. Um, I think the effects are cool. It's like a delay and a flange, but um kind of uh, made it a little difficult to hear some of the notes just because of the way that, you know, it uh, when, when you have a sound that delays over itself and, and you're playing something similar, it can get a little bit muddy. Um, so I couldn't really hear everything that he was doing, but overall, I, I liked what I heard. Um, I love the power behind it, though. I mean, it just it's, it's a good, good rocking song. Um, even in this version, I think that it's it's got a real powerful edge to it, you know. Okay, so that's kind of cool. That guitar sound that he's using in the solo uh, really diminishes in volume, but it's actually following the backing vocals quite nicely and adding a, just a little bit of spice to that. I like that. Um, backing vocals sound good, but I think now they should have been dropped down a little bit more in volume, and we should be hearing what John Sloman is doing more in the foreground because he's really singing his heart out here. And it's just it's just like he ran across a football field and said, uh, don't worry, you'll still be able to hear me. I think it, it could have been um, a little bit stronger if that would have been more in the foreground and the backing vocals would have taken the, uh, you know, the step back, still been present, but obviously really just letting his uh, his passion come through. 
and show that in the song. So I, I, I'm kind of a downer on the end of it, but I think the song has a lot of great elements to it. I can definitely see where the final came from. I like the fact that, that they did think that there was enough merit in the song to actually redo it on Abominog and put it out as a regular album track because I, I do think it's a good track. I think this track makes a good B-side. Um, it, it feels kind of close, but not really polished yet. You know, like a, like a pearl that you're polishing and it's getting close. So you show your friend, hey, look, this is coming along well. It's worth showing it to you. It's worth taking a minute of my time out to stop and say, hey, look at this. And then, of course, you know, you finish polishing and then you get the final version on Abominog, which we're going to listen to right now. That's a pretty cool intro, I have to say. Um, I like that a lot better than the piano intro. The progression seems to be the same or very similar, but uh, I just like the sound of that better. There's three different layers going on. It sounds really good. Um, now, I, I'll point out, and we'll get more into this when we get to the Abominog uh, season, which is coming very quickly. But uh, for the purpose of this version, I'll tell you on guitar, of course, we have Mick Box. On vocals now, we have Peter Golby. On bass, we now have Bob Daisley, and you guys might know Bob Daisley from Ozzy Osbourne, also from Rainbow's Long Live Rock and Roll album. Um, we have Lee Kerslake back on drums, and we have on keys and vocals, John Sinclair. So I don't know uh, what the status was of, of Greg. I don't know why he uh, didn't become part of the band. Maybe he just filled in for a song, had something else going on. I don't know. Really don't know anything about him. But uh, I can say that he played on the other version of Think It Over. So now we have uh, this version of Think It Over from Abominog. And already I, I feel like it's um, it's a bigger song. You know, it has a, a much more epic opening to it. There's lots of layers going on, some really cool sounds, a little bit of contrast, but it all works together really well. So maybe it's because I'm more familiar with this version that uh, John Sloman's voice sounded a little thin in it, in his version to me. Uh, that's very possible, very fair. Um, I don't think John Sloman has a bad voice at all, but I think that this song really needed something a little bit, um, you know, a little more low end, a little more gritty. And I think Peter Golby really delivers that on the song. I think it brings out another level of the song that's just more powerful, has more punch, shows it's a, a bigger song, a little more important. And uh, and I really like the sound of it. I love the sound of the band. I think it's interesting that, you know, this is, uh, you know, the first uh, song that we have really without Ken Hensley in the band in 13 albums. And here we, we've got a return to the theremin. And, uh, you know, it's kind of playing in the background. There's a couple of really nice synths playing behind everything. It's got a full, rich sound to the song. Uh, guitars sound great. They, they sound very similar to what they sounded like on the other version, maybe a little bit heavier. But uh, yeah, I, I dig this. I've always loved that little part there from Mick. Um, it seems like he's kind of looking at this going, okay, I need to fill in the gaps now. And uh, it, it sounds to me on this song, like he's taking a little bit uh, even more of an active role than we're used to. 
and just kind of saying, look, I'm leading this band and we're going to make it, we're going to make it work. We're going to make these songs interesting again. And, you know, not that in my opinion, they weren't before, but, you know, looking at some of the feedback on the Conquest album and um, just, just people saying it was too straightforward. It was too poppy. You know, I feel like he's doing everything he can to bring Uriah Heat back to rock and roll again. And I really love that, but I just love the way he plays that part. Love the vibrato and the way the last note carries out. Which really brings me back to the solo on the first version and why that, you know, that rise in pitch just cut off all of a sudden. I don't know if that was an engineering mistake. I don't know if that was planned, but it's more traditional to do it like this, where you're playing something interesting and it's getting the focus. But as the focus is about to switch to the vocals or whatever for a chorus, this still needs to complete itself and just cutting itself off doesn't really work. You just let it blend, you know, let that note fade out whether you have vibrato on it or not, let it fade out into the chorus. So you can, you can complete that in your head. You can say, okay, I know what happened. It's resolved. And now back to the chorus. So I think this is, this was performed and and mixed much better as far as that goes. So I want to talk for a second about what Bob Daisley is playing on the bass on this song because he is absolutely killing it. Uh, love what he's playing. Love that low to high, low to high. And um, he's got some great fills that he's playing in there on the bass. But, you know, it's it's so weird because up until this last album, really, we're so used to bass being such a prominent instrument in the mix where it's really up front and uh, now it's it's just kind of been blended in, as we've heard on a good chunk of Conquest, but it's just really blended in and it doesn't stand out as much. But that doesn't mean that what's being played isn't just as spectacular, because if you really listen to what he's playing during the verse, it's actually quite fantastic. And uh, I, I think that's definitely worth mentioning. I really love that part. I love the chorus. I love how strong it sounds. I love what Mick's playing coming out of that. Uh, Some really interesting stuff that it's really helping move the song along, but just keep it interesting instead of just repeating uh, the pattern again. But there's one sound in there that's always kind of, I don't know, it's always been out of place to me. So I'm going to play it for you guys. You think what you will on it. But uh, yeah, it's always been a little bit weird. Did you guys hear that? That beep? It sounded like a recording tone or like a fryer at a fast food restaurant that said your fries are done. It's really weird. It's so out of place. You know, it doesn't quite fit in with what the keyboards were playing. So I don't know if that was the sound that got on the tape by accident and it just kind of worked. So they left it in or if that was intentional. But it's always stood out to me as a little bit odd. It's a cool sound, but it's always just seemed a little odd to me. So I'm going to play it for you guys one more time before we get back into the song. On the bright side of things, though, I will say I absolutely love how the guitars sound here. I think that it's um, just just a great blend. They they have a very similar tone, but yet you can tell them apart. And they just feel, you know, real lush for a distorted guitar. Uh, I think the EQ on it really helps with that. But man, it sounds good. Now, I do have one rule on this show, and that is that you do not interrupt a mic box solo. Now, I'm going to guess that some of you are probably thinking that I just did that, but I'm going to argue that I didn't because I think they're actually two separate sections. But I'm going to go back to where it starts and just play the whole thing all the way through so we can appreciate it in its awesome glory.
Okay, that was way better. Love this solo. I think that this is much cleaner. It sounds much clearer. You could really tell what he's playing, which you really couldn't in the other. And part of that, I think, honestly, is just the effects. Um, unless you're 100% perfect when you're playing that kind of stuff, if you're using delay effects like that, it's going to start throwing the sound off at some point, even if it's a nanosecond. It's going to start making things sound a little weird and you're going to lose the dynamics in it. I like the general sound of it, but I think this sound works much better where it's just this straight distortion, some reverb. Uh, it sounds really good and clean. You can see what Mick is really doing here. And I love the way it ends. You know, it blends back into the next part the way it should. It doesn't just cut off like you're late on the cable bill. It plays out into uh, very, very quickly. It's done, you know, with a, a, a speedy transition, but it blends the way that it's supposed to. So I, I'm... I, I'm much happier, I think, with this sound than I am the previous sound. Yeah, this is fantastic. I love the the layers of the backing vocals into two different sections. I love the fact that we can hear Peter, what he's uh, feeling and singing there. It's it's more in the front. I think that it would have worked so much better with John Sloman's version. And this is proof of that, you know, really hearing the uh, the passion come out and not bearing it on the other side of the football field in the mix. Um, it just makes it more powerful. It just brings out so much more passion. You can really feel it. I can actually feel like, you know, me like squeezing my fists and just pumping up my my chest and arms and like I feel this, you know what I mean? It's I'm not physically doing that, but okay, I just did. But that's kind of that uh power of a song like this. And if it's mixed right, if it's layered right, uh which it is here as far as I'm concerned, uh you really get a whole different uh thing out of it. So you know, there are so many components that have to come together for a song to be good, let alone successful. And the mix is such a big part of it. Placement in the sound field for each sound source is such a part of it. I really love that keyboard sound that's going in the back of the uh, the chorus. Um, just that ding, 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 ding. It's, it's really got such an edge to it. You know, it really uh, adds to the song in a way that's really unexpected because I think most people, probably myself in general, would have added like a string sound or a pad sound or something to it. But that's actually really innovative and it stands out, but it doesn't dominate the sound at all. Like you can hear it. You don't have to pay attention to it to hear it, but it also isn't so prominent that it just drowns out everything else because it needs to be heard. Very, very well balanced song, I have to say. And I I want to say there was a video for this on MTV. I can't remember. Um, I want to say there was, but I, I'm not positive. You know, sometimes at it, it, my old age, I don't remember everything the way it actually happened as I've come to find out. Um, but in any case, it's a great song. I really like it. I like both versions, but I have to say this one just, it brings it up a couple of notches on the scale of intensity for me. And um, I really like the the direction of the band with, having more guitars in it, you know, being more a uh, classic rock band, I guess. Um, I like that there's still keyboards, though. I like that they didn't, you know, just say, OK, well, Ken's gone. So that's the end of the keyboards, because I think they're a very important sound, uh, especially for a band like Urahi, because they can really add some nice enhancers, uh, thicken up the sound a little bit. And um, I, I'm glad that they're carrying on the way they are. I'm really excited to see Lee Kerslake back. And, uh, you know, of course, I'm very familiar with Bob Daisley. So uh, it's nice to be hitting his era of the band um, because I've always liked his playing. But I think it's a great song. I think the second version has uh, more power to it. I wonder what the first version would have sound like had it been mixed a little bit differently, you know, with those ending vocals more in the front where you could feel that passion a little bit. I think it would have come closer for me. 
But as it stands with the two versions as they are, I think the second one was a little more powerful. I can see why it got an album release, but I can see in the first version why they thought the song had something in it enough to want to do a new version of it with the the new version of Uriah Heep. So uh, I'm glad they did. And that will wrap it up for this episode, guys. We'll see you tomorrow with another song on Uriah Heep, the Magician's Podcast. Cheers. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Uriah Heep, the Magician's Podcast. If you have enjoyed this show, please consider going over to Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast outlet, leaving a rating or a review. Be sure to subscribe to make sure that you are notified when new episodes are available. Please be sure to share this podcast with your fellow Uriah Heap enthusiasts and anyone who you think would like Uriah Heap, which should be everyone. And if you are so inclined, please feel free to contribute to the Patreon account. And if you are not a Patreon subscriber, you can also pay through the PayPal link on the website listed in the show links below. I would also like to thank Uriah Heap for their very generous support of the show. And thank you guys for listening. We'll see you in the next episode. Happy days.